Hey everyone, thanks for listening to season two of Saints in Society. We're thankful that you guys supported us through season one. Through listening, we had over 1,200 views or listens. Yeah. Is that Plays. how we plays yeah. yeah there we go which is incredible and so thank you guys for supporting the podcast and listening we hope that uh, season two would be beneficial for you guys and would be used to help equip you in understanding what it looks like for a saint to engage in society and so today we are here with brad our co-host and with our guest chris kyle and so we'll introduce them in just a minute but just say that today we are focusing on a question the question is should saints swear and so please stay tuned and listen in as we dive in and talk through the way that our language is important, but also the way that culture has shaped language. This is Saints in Society, a podcast with an aim and focus on equipping saints to live in and engage with their society. With help from experts and through diving into the word, we seek to learn how to engage culture in its terms, but not of it. We believe the gospel speaks to all areas of life and provides the answers we are looking for. So we aim to equip saints with applying the gospel to our lives, living as saints in society. Welcome to episode one of season two on Saints in Society. We're super excited to be back. And today we also have a special guest. The If you remember the trailer to this podcast, we say in it that we will interview experts in their field. Season one, we didn't interview. <laughs> it was just us two. And so I felt very guilty about that. But we finally have an expert with us. Uh, we have Chris Kyle, not the American Sniper. How often do you get that? Occasionally. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Chris it's, Kyle. It's Dr. Dr. Chris Kyle. Chris Kyle yeah. to you. Brian. Let me tell you a little bit about, about Chris. Chris uh, is a professor of linguistics at the University of Oregon. A uh, very well-educated man. He got his bachelor's in English and Spanish. Is that what that says? Yep. Dang. Are you fluent? That's a complicated question. We'll just say no, <laughs> but yeah, I can get it. I can get okay. That. Okay. Uh, and then your master's in English and then your PhD in applied linguistics from Georgia State University. So you've been studying language and in the language field for a long time, and you have single-handedly doubled the collective IQ of this podcast <laughs> just by you being here. I would say triple. <laughs> triple. <laughs> <laughs> Can you have a single digit IQ? <laughs> um, so uh, Chris is joining us today to talk about language. So we're going to get into that in a second. But first, we always start off with a little icebreaker question. We'll get to know you question. So the podcast is Saints in Society. We are saints learning how to live in and engage with our society. And we all live in the society of Eugene slash Springfield, Oregon in Lane County. And so the question is, what do you love about our society? What do you love about the area we live in? Yeah. So one thing I really like or love about Eugene is that um, people generally speaking like to enjoy God's creation outside. Mm -hmm. Like I ride my bike to work quite a ways and see lots of people just outside enjoying and the the city is set up to um, yeah, enjoy God's creation. So I really appreciate that about the people. Cool. Yeah. Brad, what about you? Similar. I think uh, the location of Eugene Springfield, there's just a lot to do in the outdoor world nearby. You're an hour from the coast, you're an hour from the mountains, a couple hours from a bigger city, Portland. You're just really central and close to a lot of things. And I think people like to take advantage of yeah, what nature has to offer, lots of hiking trails and mountains and things to do nearby. You can, you know, my hobbies of hunting and fishing, you can, from my house in Springfield in less than an hour, you can be at good fishing and decent hunting spots. And so I like the closeness to the outdoors that the city provides. Yeah. I think for me, I would agree with both of you guys. I think one of the big ones is, is I was gluten free for a couple years to try and help out my stomach. And this area is very food friendly. Mm -hmm. And so, I I mean, I grew up in Texas for like the first 13 years of my life. I never even heard the words gluten free (laughs) and you can go anywhere here and get like gluten free food and stuff like that. So I feel like we're pretty food friendly and I feel like there is like a pretty good food scene here. Mm. though I, I don't think we have a ton of restaurants i feel like we have like a pretty i don't know good eclectic choice of restaurants and whatnot so yeah 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 i think that's a good one too like the quality of local businesses when like food food trucks breweries coffee shops lots of really friendly business owners that i think do a really good job at their their work and yeah have cool spaces to hang out in but, i think also about the people like i think i've lived in a lot of places different education and, and jobs, but I really like that people are, are pretty laid back mm-hmm. in Eugene. Like I've lived in other places where people are real uptight about mm-hmm. their life and people are pretty laid back here. Like 
I, you can go to one of those restaurants with kids and people are generally speaking pretty chill. Yeah. I went to the hideout bakery yesterday and my kids were being my kids two and four, but people were just chill and cool. Yeah. It, there's actually, yeah, there's a lot of even restaurants around like Elkhorn Brewery has a kid's area. Northwest Burgers has a kid's area. Cold Fire Brewery has, you know, is very kid friendly. So mm -hmm. it is like, like a pretty kid friendly place yeah. to go out. Beer Garden has places for like kids to hang yeah. out and stuff like that. So yeah, it That's is cool. pretty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Chris, let's get to know you a little bit more. You just said you've been in a lot of places for your education. And I mentioned earlier your education in the linguistics department. Maybe uh, just give us a brief bio, marriage, family, where are you from, kids, that kind of thing. But then also, how did you get into linguistics? And what do you do now currently in the field of linguistics? Yeah, big question. Uh, okay, so I moved around a bunch as a kid, um, but we settled in Colorado on the front range by about sixth grade. Uh, lived there for a while, started learning Spanish while I was there. I worked at a restaurant, a couple of restaurants actually, um, when I was in high school. Um, so I took Spanish classes, but then also learned Spanish in the kitchen. And that's some funny crossover when I learned Spanish in the kitchen <laughs> and try to use that in class. And mm -hmm. yeah, we'll talk about that later. Maybe. Um, so I went to school, um, thinking that I was going to be a, an overseas missionary. Uh, so that's where the Spanish degree came in, uh, with English that ended up not being the, the path that was taken, but um, I traveled a lot during that time doing some research in different places, sort of pre-research for uh, missionaries before they would go. So like cultural research and um, got to use my Spanish in that, talking to folks in, in Peru and Bolivia. After I graduated college, I, I taught at a secondary school for a while, uh, Central Arkansas Christian, just outside of Little Rock in North Little Rock, Arkansas, eighth grade English, which was interesting and seventh grade Bible. Um, and pretty quickly I realized that middle school was not going to be my jam as far as <laughs> teaching was concerned. So, uh, because of some of our connections with, um, folks who were doing mission work, um, we found out about an opportunity to teach overseas in South Korea, um, where we could still be sort of financially responsible and pay on our loans, uh, but get to travel. And, uh, so we took these jobs in South Korea. My wife and I met, got married before we left and went to South Korea where we taught English in a variety of contexts. Eventually, we made our way to teaching college students, and that was awesome. We loved interacting with college age students, loved just that demographic in the classroom and out. So we came back to the U.S. to get more education so we could do it not just in Korea because we only had um, bachelor's degrees at that point, and you needed at least a master's in most places to teach English overseas. So we got uh, our master's degrees in teaching English as a second language in an English department. Through that time, I started like getting more into research because we're having to read a lot of research, and that became interesting to me. Um, we started, or I started, um, yeah, conducting my own research. I did a master's thesis, which wasn't required for my program, but I was interested in, in the research aspect of it. And that turned into, well, maybe we don't want to live overseas the rest of our lives. We, and we saw a lot of people in, um, in our field with master's degrees who were having to work, you know, a bunch of jobs to sort of make ends meet. And so I was like, mm, maybe I need some more education to sort of have a more stable type of life. Um, and I enjoyed research. So uh, I had the opportunity to go study a PhD with one of the people whose research that I was um, replicating or looking at for my master's thesis. So yeah, we moved to Georgia. And uh, yeah, I worked on my PhD and had a great experience and was fortunate enough to get a job in Hawaii first and then here in Oregon. How many places have you lived since you've been married? What's your operational definition of place? <laughs> like houses or just like cities? Yeah, I would say houses. How many different houses have you lived in since you've been married? 11. Wow. 12, Dang. something like that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Damn. Wow. Yep. How many different cities? Seven. Wow. All since you've been married. Yep. Wow. Wow. All right. Uh, yeah. So as far as research is concerned, um, again, I started as an English teacher um, to people who primarily spoke English as a first language. Um, then I started teaching a lot of English as a second language, primarily writing and speaking. Um, and primarily for uh, preparing students either to attend a university in the U.S. or, and there's sort of overlapping things here, but, or preparing them for the TOEFL exam, which is a test that folks take for a variety of reasons, but the, it was designed as an uh, academic language test for universities. So I did a lot of that sort of test prep. And so in that, there was a lot of questions like, okay, well, well what is proficient writing? What is proficient speaking? What do raters... So people who are grading these things, like what are, is affecting their perceptions of proficiency? And yeah, same thing with speaking. And then how do we communicate those things to, to the people who are taking the test? But also like, how do we teach that? How do we help people A, succeed in the university with regard to English skills, 
And also, how do we? Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, is TOEFL an acronym? Yes, the test of English as a foreign language. I think they may have actually dropped it, dropped the whole thing, and just called the TOEFL now. There's, okay. there's a variety of TOEFL tests, but um, there's a main one that's most schools accept as evidence of language proficiency. So, uh, yeah, so I do research both in the area of, okay, how do we find academic language? And as university changes, so we've been moving from sort of a, a prototypical classroom experience where you read textbooks, you go into class, you get a lecture, you take notes, you take a test or write a paper. Um, that's been slowly moving as technology has increased and as the internet has become more diverse, faster, et cetera. And then with COVID sort of more acutely, where we started taking lots of online education, lots of classes online, even when we have like sort of more traditional classes, we have recorded lectures, there's more online materials. So we've been looking at how language has changed over that time and whether the demands of the English demands of uh, the university experience or succeeding in academia has changed. Um, so that's one thing I look at is sort of like describing what we would call in nerdy terms a language use domain, but like basically how people use language in a particular area, um, like the academy or like an undergraduate education, um, which different, differs strongly from what, you know, maybe people speak in a rock climbing gym or a, or a CrossFit gym right. or, you know, having beers or something. So. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I look at is how people's language changes over time. So as they learn, like what actual linguistic features are growing, like what are they developing um, and how does that align with our perceptions of proficiency? Right. So, yeah, it, it, it's helpful. I think uh, it's helpful for both pedagogy, like how we're designing teaching materials. Like what what do we learn? And it's also helpful for making sure that tests are actually valid indicators of um, whether someone's going to succeed with regard to English uh, in university or not. Because we don't want people going to university if they don't have the skills to um, to make it. We don't want them to struggle right. unnecessarily. Yeah. I think this is also important for you to know that I am bilingual. So you were sitting here with someone, Chris, who is bilingual. I don't know if Brad is, but I just found out that I was bilingual the other night. So oh, yeah. yeah. And in, in, in what in what languages? My, he, my, he found my, it out, so you know this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my first language is English, which is a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. My second one is Southern. Mm -hmm. We were at a country concert the other night, and I grew up in the South, and my dad was, you know, born and raised in the South. Yep. Anytime my dad would call my wife when, when my dad was alive, my wife would put it on speakerphone so I could translate for him. Then we were at the concert the other night and the country artist was talking and anytime he was talking, I was translating what he was saying for my wife. So interesting. So there you go. I like it. I, I speak heavy Southern draw. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, at least I can understand it and translate it. So yeah. Yeah. You know, that's actually my first language. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is yeah. heavy Southern draw? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. We lived in the country in Arkansas oh, yeah. uh, when I was a kid until about age three. So yeah. We, my parents distinctly remember me speaking that way. Yeah. Uh, it's so. funny because my wife really was like, what did he just say? What did he say? I was like, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Totally. Which you could have just made up what he said. I could have. <laughs> I could have. Yeah. And, and I want to tell you, legitimately, linguists would say that, yeah, you're at least bi-dialectal. Uh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Man, I got to put I that mean, down. Where, that, where that we, sounds better than yeah, bilingual, by dialectal. True. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. I mean, where we draw the line between language and dialect is a little fuzzy, so, you know. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's mutual and intelligibility. That one on my resume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's cool. The main question that we're looking at, and that's what we're trying to do on each episode, is answer a question. The main question that we're trying to answer today, look at, and address with an expert in the field is should saints swear? So let's just start there. Open it up with that question. Should saints swear? What are your thoughts to just that initial question, Chris? Well, we're, we're diving right in. We're, we, we, <laughs> we are diving right in. All right. We're going to have a lot of other questions around that question, but, but just if you just gave kind of a, just a quick statement to that, what would you say? I would, I would ask the question, what do you mean by swear? <laughs> Good. Maybe a synonym for swear would be cuss. I feel like there's, we're getting at swear words, right? Yeah. Words that at least in our culture, which I think we'll talk about, would be considered uh, cuss words, words that are. And I, I would even say this for the sake of our listeners today, uh, because we want families to be able to listen to this or be able to play in the car and stuff like that. Like we will keep it PG yeah. uh, talking about certain words and, and how we shorten those words and whatnot. But I would say should a saint swear, should, should Christians use 
um, modern words that have been identified as cuss words. And then if you say, what's a cuss word? I would say something that culture has deemed a word that can't be used in certain movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going to be difficult. Yeah. For, for I, I like it. Uh, yeah. I think you're using the word culture in a way that's more broad than reality. Uh, I think we like to say what culture thinks, what culture does without sort of understanding that or without considering the idea that perhaps um, culture, our perception of culture is an amalgamation of a number of different subcultures. And we sort of tidy it up and make presumptions about what people do in general um, and what quote unquote culture is. But I, I think that that might be inappropriate. I mean, to, to do that. Yeah. And so what one culture or one subculture says is quote unquote bad doesn't mean that all cultures agree with that. Can you give us some examples? Uh, well, if we're talking about swearing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so if we talk about the F word, for example, I think in plenty of cultures, it, it's just used as an intensifier to mean more. It's more bad or, mm -hmm. you know, and certain cultures, subcultures wouldn't necessarily recognize that that's bad. It would be worse to do other, to say other things. So I'm not being particularly concrete here. That's all right. So what you said there though, is that that word is used in certain cultures just to like for a greater expression, like as more superfluous, something like that. Right, like very, very, like yeah. that's, that's very awesome. Okay. Dude, that's effing awesome. Yeah. You know, yep. is there crudeness there? I, I mean, depends on who you're talking to. Yep. Would my grandma love it? Maybe not. Yeah. So let's flip it. What are some other things that, uh, that maybe we say that, that wouldn't be deemed in the U S when I say we, what are some words that we say, we'll even, we'll even narrow it in a little bit more to the Pacific Northwest. What are some words that maybe we say that aren't swear words or cuss words, but if we said them in another culture that might be, or that would be offensive. Hmm. I think gestures are easier to talk about. Okay. Um, so in linguistics, we would probably, we would consider gestures like we would consider words that are spoken to be like vocal gestures. And so hand gestures would be considered in linguistics to be words as well. So, you know, if we say, okay, like, like this, I'm, I'm making a circle with my thumb and my forefinger and my other three fingers are up like sweet, man. That's okay. Like, okay. Sounds good. Which maybe isn't something we do very often anymore, but, uh, you know, that would be that signals in this culture. Okay. Another cultures, it would be like, Hey, you are an undesirable person or you're an a-hole or that's what something. this means. It can it, it, in, in okay. different, in different places. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we have one that that's just an example of a symbol that can mean different things. Um, for just the listeners, Chris is holding up the okay sign. So, so if you're just listening, he's holding up yeah. the sign where you make a circle with your index and thumb and I'm have disappointed the other none of you could see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's on you guys. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, hmm, did you have a specific example in mind? Uh, yeah. And, and honestly, I don't know if this is true or not, but for instance, I've heard that fanny packs, uh, like we say fanny packs can, can be really offensive in certain cultures, just the word fanny. And, uh, and from my understanding, bloody, like can be really offensive in certain cultures and stuff. And so those are words that I don't know that we would think a whole lot about saying, but in other cultures, those words can take on a whole different meaning. Yeah. And, and so I would linguistically, I would cl cl clarify that just a little bit. And that's that. Yeah. So by other English speaking cultures that are separated by an ocean and while there's overlap in media and stuff. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, that variety of, of English or those varieties, but we'll call it one variety for here. Um, you know, that variety of English grew in different ways than ours did. Right. And I think it's important to think about language, uh, or we, we can break it down to just, if we talk about a word, yep. a word is a symbol that represents something, right? So if we have the word tree, uh, all of us who speak English as a, uh, fairly well are going to have a mental representation of some type of plant that probably has a trunk at the bottom. Maybe it's brownish. Not all trees, I guess, have brown trunks, but you know, and have some leaves on them uh, or pine needles or something similar. I'm not a botanist. Um, however, that word tree is completely arbitrary. We all agree 
that tree is, you know, that plant that there's a bunch of in Eugene. But, you know, in, in Spanish, it's going to be arbol. In other languages, those groups of people have decided that that symbol or that a particular symbol means tree, right? Uh, and so this, the same thing goes with more nuanced things within languages, right? Uh, where, okay, so Fanny is something that, you know, people might, is a polite way of saying, but, right? Uh, in America or in certain aspects, certain parts, parts of America, uh, but means something else in the UK, right? And so we've decided that Fanny is a polite way of saying, but where in the UK, they decided it means something else. Right, a different, slightly different part of the body. Uh, so, um, I think that arbitrariness and the fact that society uh, or groups of people decide that a word means something is an important concept, and it's also important to to know that those meanings shift over time, um, and they they shift maybe more for some in some cultures than others. And I mean, we're sort of experiencing that right now a little bit with with uh, what might be referred to as sort of more linguistic wars or or PC wars. That are, that are going on, that those words or those symbols are taking on different meanings for different groups of people. With with language being so uh, malleable and the construction of letters being arbitrary to certain groups of people and that kind of thing, how do we prevent them from saying language doesn't matter? Or m maybe the question I'm trying to get at is, like, theologically, we have, like, God created with words and he's communicated to us through language and so there's there's some sense of i don't know value permanence to language to words so theologically how do we as christians balance the importance of the words we've been given in scripture the words that god has spoken to us but then also recognize the yeah the the arbitrariness of the particular symbols that we've used to describe things yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think that's a, a somewhat loaded question, right? Mm -hmm. um, that lots of people have argued about and continue to argue about, you know, is the King James Version like right. the authoritative translation into English that many people may feel strongly about? Mm -hmm. um, I think from my background in linguistics, my, my take would be that it's important to consider who God was talking to and when and what those words meant meant in that context mm -hmm. um i think that's really important so you know i could we could be sort of joking around i'm, I'm giving an example here uh, but we could be joking around in a gym or you know just you guys were hunting or or something uh and i could be like you know i could say a swear word towards you and it would be the purpose of that would be joking around building camaraderie etc like we're not being super formal here we know each other well enough to be like i can you know say words that in other that i wouldn't say my grandma but i can joke around with you guys to build relationships we can argue about whether that's right or not but that's different than being in traffic and being like you know bad word towards you mm -hmm. uh and so the context there is important when i say it in traffic i'm expressing anger and context and intent yeah. right yeah like the intention of using it yeah for sure so i mean all that uh, maybe that wasn't the greatest example but the idea is trying to I mean, through God's grace, right? Interpreting what was being said to those people at that time um, and what God was communicating to those people at that time and focusing more on the context and those inter, not personal, but um, in some cases, like with letters, interpersonal relationships um, and what that looks like and what, what they were trying to say there is important, I think, in interpreting language. It's almost like hermeneutics matter, you know? And context matters. Almost. Yeah. yeah. Almost. So one of the things that that we try and do in saints and society, and when when we under, when we talk about society, we're talking about people, relationships, and when we think about words and we think about language, like language impacts and it typically involves relationships. Of course, we can talk to ourselves and whatnot, but typically when we're thinking about language, when we're thinking about words, what we're thinking about is how the words that we use, the language we speak impacts the society in which we live, in which people hear, how we relate to them and that sort of stuff. And so what we want to address is how, how do saints appropriately engage their society? And, and, and one of the questions with that is, should saints or 
maybe the better question is where do we draw the line on what we should and shouldn't say in conversations? And, and so to where something becomes sinful, to where something becomes hurtful, to where uh, maybe in certain uh, cultures around the world, the F word is, you know, used to say more or very, but in certain cultures here, it's this. So should we not do it then based upon culture standard or where do we bring in a biblical standard? And so it just kind of gets confusing from that perspective. So if you could speak to that, I think it's also helpful to know this, that, that you are a professor at a university, but you are also a gospel community leader. You are a Christian, you are a believer. <laughs> and, 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 and so we have someone speaking to these things as an expert in the field, but also from a Christian and biblical perspective. So, yeah. yeah. Was he trying to censor me there? <laughs> was, was he saying be careful what you're saying <laughs> no because i realized that we, that we never said that oh, like yeah. as like, like giving never like, a church yeah and yeah a leader you know, and, and, and so yeah. so yeah okay well you rephrase the question for me yeah just briefly yeah what words should we say and how should we equip or teach people to engage in society in such a way to where it's not sinful or hurtful and yeah i guess i have so many questions with that because where does conscience right. play into it because you know so many people for pastors, Chris, they, they ask questions like this, how much can I drink? Because they want us to give them <laughs> limits, permission right. yeah, and, and, and limits. And people are like, what can I do with my girlfriend? Where's the line drawn? And, and people like this are like, can I cuss? And for some people, I think it's like a, a, a way to show that like you're cool and that you're not legalistic and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And people would say the same thing about drinking. Like you're just trying to show that you're cool and not legalistic. And so how do we engage culture? And where's the line for sin? Where's the line for being hurtful and those types of things? Yeah. Maybe you can rephrase it, Brad, uh, a little bit better. You normally take what I say and then you just <laughs> rephrase it and make it a lot better. And you do that in a very self-righteous, arrogant way. Right. Yeah. Mm. That's how I, yeah. Um, maybe an example we uh, have talked before. Mark Driscoll was known as the cussing pastor. Yeah. And obviously there's a whole thing like, bunch of stuff we could talk about Mark Driscoll, right? But part of his like missional strategy, I think, to draw the like younger hipster Seattle crowd was to be a little more edgy with his language. And it worked, right? Totally. I mean, people were like, oh, this is not your suit and tie, uh, like very, I don't know, not well-spoken, but you know, no cuss word kind of Christian pastor. It, it was different. And so as Christians, is, is, that a, is that a viable perspective to have on how we engage with our society is or is there a line to where our like missional engagement by using the words that our society is using crosses over into sin yeah man a lot of questions Does, <laughs> is someone's like like would it be a sign of immaturity if a christian cusses because i think in a lot of ways if, if you're in the south or in certain parts of you know the the u.s they're like you can't be a real Christian if you use words like that, and you know, or you're just a really immature Christian and whatnot. So, so yeah. Or have you ever been around non-believers who they'll say they know you're a pastor, they'll cuss around you, and then they'll be like, "Oh, sorry," like you know, totally. Like that. Yeah, I yeah. shouldn't have said that. Like there's yeah. th there's this expectation that Christians are not associated with a particular set of words. There's like 15 questions yeah. in there, Chris. Pick one. Yeah. <laughs> We're being transformed in, in the likeness of Christ. So what does it look like for our language and the way that we use that to be transformed? And does yeah. that mean no cussing? Because I've also watch people that come into Christianity and that's a burden to put on people that all of a sudden you're supposed to like not say any of these words that you used for so long mm -hmm. and inside of your family, they weren't seen as necessarily bad words. And so, yeah, there's just a lot there. Like what does it look like for us to be transformed in a Christ likeness, but also in our language? And yeah. So sure. take one of those 64 yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. I'll start going. And if I start rambling, then we can just, we can just edit that out. Right, yeah, Zach? Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> I think one thing that's maybe helpful as we think about this is that we perform identities in a lot of different ways. Uh, so by perform identities, I mean that like as we interact with society, we are trying to tell either in inadvertently or inadvertently, so on purpose or not on purpose, we're, we're trying to tell or we do tell people around us something about us, right? So we do that in a number of ways. One is, you know, the way we dress, right? Another is how polite we are to people how we drive. There's a whole bunch of what, what cars we choose to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have a, a big fishing hook on your hat, you know, you're, you're telling something to the world totally that, you know, uh, you know, Rick's tattoos are telling something to the world. So, you know, his lifted Subaru is telling something to the world, mm. right? Mm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Brad's big truck is telling something to the world. My Forrester wilderness is you know, <laughs> telling everyone at 
the coffee shop that you know i like anyways uh <laughs> sorry making fun of myself i like my car uh but the, the point is that um language is is a key way in which we are telling the world what our identity is so that's one part i think of how we can think about this issue and i'll come back to that uh, i think the other part is that at least as far as well our backgrounds are going to affect what uh, our experiences in life are going to affect what we think those different symbols mean right so for some people uh you know a fishing hook on your hat you know means something so you know in the south you know it means that maybe you like to fish or mm -hmm. you like to be in the woods right maybe that's that's a symbol and maybe in new york it means something else okay maybe that's a bad example but you know or your lululemon shorts you know might mean uh <laughs> might mean one thing in He's talking to Brad right now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But looking at Rick. <laughs> yep. uh, you know, those things, maybe, maybe to some people it means Rick likes to be comfortable in his shorts. You know, maybe to other people it means that he thinks he's a cool dude. He's stylish. Um, maybe he is. I don't know. Yeah. All right. I'm getting off track. But the idea is that those things can mean different things to different people because of our experiences. Um, so while I think the world is, you know, an objective real place, our realities or like how we experience the world is can be different based on our, our background. So that extends to language. So, you know, to some people, if they hear the word ain't, that immediately for them marks that person as less educated, right? In many contexts. And that's what like prescriptive grammar or like, you know, your eighth grade grammar teacher would tell you. Can't you can't use ain't. Mm -hmm. That's not educated. Like, okay, well, linguistically, it's super functional, right? Uh, there's no like linguistic reason why ain't yeah. isn't I ain't gonna stop using it. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't going down the sun comes up, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Garth Brooks, 1990. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, um, but like a word like ain't is a is a nice non curse word example of words that in some places will, if you use the word ain't, it's going to bring like a group, sort of a group identity. So uh, if you're in the South, uh, for example, and you know you use ain't, maybe you're demonstrating that hey, we're all Southern together, or whatever we want to call that and that society is a good thing and if i go down to you know a gas station in kentucky and i'm speaking quote unquote properly then i'm being marked as an outsider but if i use you know other language like ain't and so on and so forth yes sir yes ma'am uh then i'm marking myself as more of an insider so anyways the point there is that language means different things to different people based on their experiences so can we not offend people by the language that we use uh, I think we're always going to offend somebody mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form or communicate something that we maybe didn't intend to mean. So can we perfectly like go throughout the world without offending people? I don't think so. Can we be careful about the things that we're saying and knowledgeable about the ways in which the language we use could be taken from different folks? Absolutely. We can. So coming back to cursing, uh, you know, just even that word cursing like we've labeled something as like a curse like the word is already like it's right. a cursed word it's a curse word I don't... yeah so we're is the word cursed or is it being used in a way that that pronounces cursing on people mm -hmm. like is that where I, I don't even know where that came from like I've, why is it called a curse word i yeah. haven't done the stuff that, okay. that study on the okay. etymology but yeah. i presume it's started with cursing someone okay yeah right, right. yeah um so you know damning someone to hell essentially yeah yeah, yeah. um but that changes so um so I think in the, the sort of Mark Driscoll perspective uh, or like maybe even like a Donald Miller blue like jazz kind of, I think that if we use prim and proper language and that marks our identity, um, then to some people using prim and proper language brings on extra things. It's not just that, oh, they're, they're not cursing. It's that, oh, they're not cursing on purpose to demonstrate that they're perfect and better than me who curses. Um, and therefore, I need to bring my language up to snuff before mm -hmm. I can even enter into this domain, right? Or I need to, you know, if I'm going to teach a college course, I need to speak like a college professor, despite any knowledge that I have, right? Uh, so from that perspective, is cursing or saying swear words, four letter words, is it, is it bad? I, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. um, I think it can be used to make people feel comfortable. Um, I think we need to be careful. I think we need to be knowledgeable about what we're saying. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say just like, yeah, say whatever that society says. I think that we can be real conscious about what we're saying. I mean, is saying, gosh, darn, is that a good thing to say? 
you know where, where did we get that or crap like is that yep. is that better substantively better than those other alternatives you know gosh darn is just a watered down version of something we absolutely should not say i think in my opinion right and crap means poop and so does the four letter version of poop does that carry any extra weight to it other than what we've arbitrarily said oh this is a bad version of that and by the way that like so the four letter version of poop that doesn't start with p you know that's that's a classist thing just like ain't so back in england give you a history lesson here in 1066 the french came over conquered england um and so that set up a society where uh, england was ruled by the french so the, the aristocracy leaders were french spoke french the church spoke latin and the commoners spoke english okay so eventually that came out to mean that well the four letter version of poop that doesn't start with p uh you know was an english word and so that became a bad word because it's what the commoners spoke right not unlike our perceptions of ain't uh where oh yeah that's that's uneducated talk down there it, a very similar thing so historically that's a perspective mm -hmm. uh but then we also have to consider what it means to different people in different places so yeah. um but i think that's substantively different than watering down curse words and saying oh well i didn't say i didn't say the bad version of gosh darn i said this watered down version like what does that really mean like when we say that what does that mean or not using curse words and making fun of somebody i think that's much more hurtful in most contexts than using a four letter word yeah Today's local business spotlight is Boomi. Boomi is a new business that is located in the Meridian building on the corner of 18th and Willamette. Owner Molly DeCoste recently moved to Eugene from Colorado after her two sons moved to the area. Molly, her husband, and her 13-year-old sold their home and their legal support business and headed out on their new Oregon adventure. Molly quickly decided to start her own business here in Eugene Bumi means earth in Hindi. It is a refill station that buys bulk quantities of eco-friendly options of everyday household and personal care products, which allow customers to refill containers rather than waste the plastic packaging that would occur by purchasing a new single-use container each time. Bumi also sells eco-friendly options for other products such as bamboo toothbrushes, reusable straws, and reusable snack bags, among other things. There's also a potting bar where you can buy a pot and a plant from the store, or you can bring in your own plant and pot your own. They supply soil, rocks, pots, plants, things that you need to pot your plants. And Molly will even clean up the mess that you make at a small cost. Boomi is also a TerraCycle drop-off location for things that you might not even realize are recyclable, like toothpaste bottles, razor blades, things like that. The goal of Boomi can be summed up nicely by its mission statement to breathe life and awareness back into the planet by advocating for a more conscious way of life that focuses on using and producing less waste. They hope to accomplish this by helping to eliminate the need for disposables that strain our finite resources and damage our planet while offering a variety of everyday product options that are eco-friendly, sustainable, and fair trade. Essentially, living as lightly as possible on our shared earth and leaving no trace. Boomi offers great convenience by offering a wide variety of refill options so you don't have to drive all around town trying to find the refills that you need. Molly also has a great attitude towards her industry. She doesn't want it to be competitive. Molly wants everyone to win and work together to help each other to be good stewards of the planet that we are blessed to care for. So check out Boomi for all of your bulk personal care or household items to help reduce waste and care for our earth. Say hi to Molly and let her know that you heard about her store on the podcast. So, so let me ask this, any topic that comes up, we, we want to be faithful stewards of God's word and yeah. we want to let God's word speak in a culture, not let the culture speak in God's word. It seems though in Christianity, this is a, th this is something where we've let the culture shape language and shape what bad words are and then speak that in the Bible and say that like, 
these words, since culture, based upon the story that you just told us in history, since culture has deemed this as a curse word or a swear word, therefore, in order to be faithful to our Bible, we have now taken a word from culture and read that into it. What does it look like, I guess, to faithfully read what God's standard is into our culture instead of letting culture define the terms when it comes to language? Because it seems like that's what we've done. In, in, in any other area, most Christians, faithful Bible Christians would push back and be like, hey, we don't let culture to, you know, dictate the Bible and we don't let culture be read into the Bible. We read the Bible into culture. And so this seems like an area, though, where we're perfectly OK letting culture kind of define the terms on what's cuss words and whatnot. So, yeah. And the same thing with alcohol, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, one of the verses we have here to talk about Ephesians four twenty nine is helpful in that regard. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So that word corrupting, uh, it's like uh, rotten or putrid. And so, so it, it has the connotation of like destruction and, and decaying and tearing down. And you can see that also with the contrast is don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouths, rather only talk that is good for building up. So words that are constructive and building people up as fits the occasion. So there's a contextualization that you do with your, with your speech and that it gives grace to those who hear. So I feel like that's a, a good standard. You can, corrupting talk that tears people down, you can, you can speak in a corrupting way that tears people down and never use a four-letter word that our culture is deemed yep. a swear word. So then maybe the other question is, can you build someone up with a four-letter word that culture is deemed a swear word? Maybe, you know, like there, there could be a heart and intention that uh, is to give grace and build someone up that let me give an example understands that. the context yeah right. so if someone's going through a really 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 difficult season in life and, and and I'm meeting with them pastorally talking with them or not just people in the church that meet with their friends and, and they're going through a really rough season and I say hey I'm sorry about the poopy season that you're in right now I, I actually don't know that that's going to carry as much weight and gravity for like me empathizing with them and meeting them where they're at to, to recognize and call it what it is. Like, I'm sorry for the SH season that you're going through right now. It seems like it, it is, it carries more gravitas. Mm -hmm. Like it has more gravity, more understanding, more empathy to, to recognize, man, this is not a normal situation. Right. This is hard. Yeah. I think that's why the song, mm -hmm. A Prayer by King's Kaleidoscope is, is, is a song of lament and they got a lot of pushback because the F words in that song, I would say that song has given grace to me and to my wife. It has built us up because we have listened to that song in hard times. And both of us have cried together listening to it because he's mm -hmm. like crying out in, in a lament. So he's using a four letter word. He's using the F word. Got a lot of pushback. But that song has ministered deeply to our soul of what it is to just feel yeah. just at a dark, lonely place. Yeah. The, the line in that song is this fear is effing violent, right? Yeah. And like that's a... I mean, you also add the layer of it being poetry, but you're you're taking that kind of uh, what we said earlier about the F word being like an amplifier almost. Yeah. It's like in like an extreme way that is almost uncomfortable culturally, but communicates it on a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. You can listen to the clean version of that song and it just doesn't carry the same kind mm -hmm. of weight. But because that particular four letter word is in it, like you said, they got pushed back. And so, yeah, that's, I think, the question. Yeah. I think that's that's exactly as I was sort of think about this over the last couple of days, that is the exact type of um, situation that came to my mind as well. Like just that type of empathy and empathizing with people. You're mm -hmm. not only communicating a, the intensity of their bad season uh, or the difficult season, but also depending on the people you're talking to, you're also like breaking down barriers at the same time. Yeah. Right. Totally. You're, not, you're not like, here, let me put on my white gloves and then let's mm -hmm. talk about this, your life. And I'll make sure that I don't use any potentially offensive language to people who are worried about four letter words, but you can deeply empathize with them and also break down, break down social barriers potentially. Yeah. I think to, to go back and maybe even think about this when we're talking about curse words in culture and whatnot, I believe the Bible always has a higher standard. And so if culture says like, Hey, you don't say the F word, you don't say SH, some of these words, and that's always going to shift like per family. And, and so like there's some families who you, who you can't say butt in, or there's some families you have to say poop. Some families are okay saying crap. So it's like lines are getting drawn in different places. And, and then if we look at scripture, the standard is so much higher because it's every word that comes out of your mouth. So I, I could be super offensive by even addressing you by your uh, appropriate title. I could be like, 
Hey, thanks, Dr. Kyle. Like that's super helpful advice. And, and like, th that's actually tearing you down though. I use your like appropriate title yeah. and everything like that. But I'd say that's more offensive than, than if I was like, like, you know, Chris, I'm in a really blank season of life or something like that. It's like, I admit, man, I didn't tear you down. And yeah. So, so I, I think the biblical standard is so much greater because people gossip like crazy. Yep. People slander people like crazy and, and do those things. And you can do all those without ever saying a swear word, but, but it's not even that the standards even higher that every word that we speak out of our mouths is intended to give grace to the hearers. Like, I mean, if there's something that shows how much we sin on a daily basis, not every word I speak gives grace to those that are around me, you yeah. know? So I, I don't know. It, it looked like you had something you were going oh, yeah, to add. Yeah, I was just, I, the, it's actually way easier to not say four letter words than it is to do what the Bible actually says with our, with Dude, our mouths. Dude, that's good. Yeah. Um, and so it's almost, it's almost like a cop out in a way of like, if you don't say these certain words, then your, your language is good. Your mouth is good. When like you're saying, there could be gossip, tearing people down, you know, right. mean jokes that never use any of those four letter words. And it's like prim and polished. It's like a whitewashed tomb situation mm -hmm. on yep. the outside there. The language is proper yet. What's actually going on on the inside is what the Bible actually speaks to. Um, and that's much more difficult. Yeah. I like Philippians four, eight, which doesn't use the word speak, but I think that it's, it's close. I think it's applicable. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And man, I think that's a challenge. I mean, I think that's like a, a great challenge for what we say as well, right? It's not just what we think about, but but what we communicate to folks yeah. as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that, I mean, that's a pretty high bar. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a darn high bar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also like there are passages that tell us to put away things. And, and oftentimes what, you know, uh, I know Peter speaks of this, but like put away malice and envy and slander and gossip and these things. It's like, put these things away. And I think to what you're saying, Brad, many Christians are like, well, let's put away four letter words. But he's like, no, no, no. Like, like there's a lot more that's got to be put away, you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so I, I remember even sitting in with, with a young man going through really difficult season. And I was with another older pastor and I was so disappointed in him. Mm -hmm because this young man was opening up about all of his story in life. And he did so with what we would call profanity, curse words, swear words, and whatnot. The pastor stopped him after he like was opening up and going and said, Hey, I'm going to stop you right there and want you to proceed forward without using any of the cuss words. Mm -hmm. and, and the, and the, and the guy just shut out. Mm -hmm. like he was done. And I was like, man, see what you did. It's, it, it's like you shut a guy down because you're trying to correct his, four letter words that was trying to open up his heart and share what was going on in his life and stuff like that. So, so, so yeah, I've even been on sides of the table to where, it, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like we're so focused on that. Yeah. When I don't know that in that moment, I would deem anything that he was saying as he was sharing his story as sinful. Like, like it, it wasn't tearing us down. It wasn't tearing anyone else down. Mm -hmm. in, in some ways I would say it was giving grace because I could relate to the painfulness that was going on in his story. I think the very words that didn't give grace to the hearers were the pastor chiming mm -hmm. in and saying, stop saying those words. Yeah. Which is really disheartening. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, I want to be gracious towards those. I wonder, maybe Chris, you could speak to this. Oftentimes when I think about people like that pastor, yeah. it's like an older generation of Christians. Yeah. And I do wonder if the particular four letter words maybe meant something different. You know, like how has mm -hmm. our culture changed in a relatively short amount of time to where, you know, we can now hear the F word and it's an amplifier vary a lot more. Maybe that... For, for for a generation or two ago that that was it was never used that way and i don't know that we don't have to go through the etymology of every single <laughs> swear word but i, I try to be taking all the fun brad <laughs> try to be <laughs> try to be gracious towards maybe those who because you said earlier um our experiences our contexts are you know we have a, a, when we hear things or receive the symbols language words we receive those in a certain way so Anyway, no, there wasn't a question there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You said, like, how do we be gracious to mm -hmm. maybe people from an older generation mm -hmm. who, you know, just yeah. have just a strong reaction to those words, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I heard two questions. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll try to address both of them. First, I think those words existed back then in those ways. I mean, I think people used them as intensifiers back then. But I 
I do think the context in which they were used were much more narrow. Um, and so we had this divide, I think, at least we can simplify it and say there's this divide between good, squeaky clean Christians and then drunks and ne'er-do-wells, right? Mm -hmm. uh, however you want to call the other side of that. Um, and I think that people pushed back against hypocrisy and also pushed back against this like holier than thou idea and started pushing what was acceptable in different cultures and with language, with other things too, but certainly with language. So I think there was like sort of this, um, it was part of partially a pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're telling me these are bad words and F that, mm -hmm. you know what? Yeah. Uh, I reject sort of this hypocrisy that you stand for. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but I think that's part of it. So um, I think your point is well taken that like we need to think about who we're talking to um, when we use words and phrases all the like no matter who we're talking to mm -hmm. like we need to think about who we're talking to and what we are communicating to those people how we're loving those people and i think rick i think your point that we can i think we can disagree about what christians should say as far as four-letter words are concerned i absolutely think that we should agree that we need to give grace to people mm -hmm. uh and in the words they use yeah yeah absolutely you know explain more what you mean by that i think if we if we understand that people use um experience world differently have different backgrounds different words mean different things to different people and the weight of those words are different in different contexts and the connotation of those words are different in different contexts i think we shouldn't force our connotations of those words onto other people when they're bearing their souls mm -hmm. um, and not equate not cursing with being worthy to be inside a church building yeah. or have a theological conversation. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I think that's maybe more impactful than should I cuss or should I not cuss? I think there are situations where saying certain four letter words in certain contexts is not sinful. Um, that's a personal opinion. I think that, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God's grace is good. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do think that we, we have an example of being loving to people and not pushing our own, uh, stuff on them before they've accepted Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's a really good point, and we're probably getting close on time, so we should start to wrap up here. But to extend grace to people for their language has to come from a place where we realize that we've received grace for the use of our tongue. And uh, James three talks about taming the tongue, and the, some of the stuff James says in here is, I mean, it pins us with like. Uh, our imperfection. He says, for we all stumble, verse two of chapter three, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. <laughs> he will also bridle his whole body. So if you've never stumbled with your tongue, if you've never said anything, you know, corrupting, or you've always given grace, then you're perfect. Like in all areas of life, that's how difficult it is to tame the tongue. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to talk about the tongue being uh, like a fire in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. All these birds and beasts have been tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. So if, if we recognize our own inability to tame the tongue and how much grace we've received from Jesus, who always spoke perfectly, never spoke corrupting talk, never tore anyone down, always spoke spoke truth, always built people up, always showed grace, always understood the context, just spoke perfectly in every single way, and that perfection has been implied to us by grace, then I think we can start to extend grace to others for their speech when we recognize the grace we've received for the imperfection of our own. Yeah, I would 100% agree. The way the gospel speaks of this is that every single person on the face of the earth other than Christ Jesus has failed in how we've used our tongue mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Words we speak don't give grace to the hearers. I mean, the way that we talk about our city, our culture, people in a negative fashion, these are all people that are created in the image of God. It's like, like there are so many ways on a daily basis that, that our words don't give grace. Every, every motive, every heart intention, every word that was spoken by Christ was spoken perfectly. And as you said, that's been imputed to us. The, we, we aren't seen by God based upon our language, based upon how we use our verbiage or even our hard intentions. We're seen for Christ's life of that perfectly and our place, which I think speaks to how we live our lives. 
how we engage because I also don't want to go through life recognizing this, that maybe I have the freedom as a Christian to say the F word, maybe I have, a, I have the freedom to say this, but there's also certain people that I can be around who I want to understand the gospel and maybe they're very pharisaical or legalistic and me using that language is going to, uh, it's going to be a hindrance to them mm-hmm. listening to anything else I say, or just knowing that that could be offensive to, you know, to people that I'm around, but, but being like, oh yeah, we'll I have the freedom to say it. And so I'm going to exercise that freedom. I'm like, I'm a slave then trying to prove how free I am, mm-hmm. you know? Right. And, and, yeah. and so I think in heart intention is important. Like, why are you doing it? Because if you're doing it to be cool or edgy or like you're doing it to be like, check me out or mm-hmm. you're doing it for some motive like that, then I think it comes back to the heart. Like, what is the heart intention behind it? And then at the end of it, can you say all glory to God? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, let it be for the glory of God, you know, mm-hmm. because I think in some cases you can, when you're empathizing with people, turn around and, and give glory to God, you know, and, yeah. and, and say thank, uh, thank you. But there's also times where I think some people are trying to be cool or edgy or something like that. So. You definitely would not be able to find in scripture where language and words don't matter. So whatever goes, right? There's a, there's a reverence on the importance of language, the importance of words, the importance of what we do with our tongue, with our mouths in building up and tearing down and praising God and cursing others and all this kind of stuff. And so Jesus says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And so I think we are aware of the society we live in. We're aware of the context we are in, in various relationships and with various people we extend grace, we receive grace from Jesus, and then we, we use wisdom to navigate different situa- situations with what we say and don't say in a way that glorifies God. Like you said, that's good. So, yeah. This was a super fun conversation. Thank you, Chris, for being with us and bringing your expertise to the table. I had a lot of fun. I think this is helpful, relevant, and practical for how, I mean, like you said earlier, Rick, if society is people, we engage with people through language. And so how we think through the language that we use as saints living in society is super vital. So uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. We've got more in store uh, the rest of the season. So hope you'll stay with us.